ask is for my Republican colleagues, go out there, sit down with the Senate Democrats, sit down with the House Democrats. Don't just say take it or leave this bill that we know has such draconian cuts and doesn't do anything to invest in America's future. We can't continue down this road. We've got to work together. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as my, I may consume uh, to associate myself with the gentleman from New Jersey's uh, comments. We absolutely have to work together. And it, it's a great source of pride for me that I've only been on the job 60 days, and we've already seen more working together than this House has allowed in the past four years combined. Understand that. Understand that as we're working on this appropriations bill, as we're working through this appropriations process, that two weeks ago, you saw more openness and working together in this chamber, right here, right here in the people's house, more working together than you had seen in the previous four years combined. Can we do more? I say to the gentleman from New Jersey, I think we can, and I look forward to being a partner and making that happen. But to say that what is sitting on the desk in the Senate is the product of take it or leave it legislating, it could not be further from the truth. It's the furthest from take it or leave it legislating that the House has seen in four years. Arguably, it's the, it's the, it's the furthest thing from take it or leave it legislating that the House has seen on continuing appropriations bills in modern time. And so when we talk about where we are and, and where we're going, we have to ask that question of, of why are we characterizing this as a process that's that's broken? Why are we characterizing H.R. 1 as, as something that doesn't work? Why isn't H.R. 1 the very best? The very best, given the makeup of this House, given our collective intellect and wisdom, why isn't H.R. 1 the very best that we could do? Because when the process is open and everyone gets to participate, it ought to bring out our very best. Now, I'll say the gentleman from New Jersey, he has some of the lowest gas prices in the country. And I enjoy traveling through his great state every time I go through. Not only do I get full-service gasoline, I get it for the best prices in the country. Gas prices are up 25 cents a gallon in Gwinnett County, where I come from. 25 cents a gallon in the past 10 days. We have economic crises in this country. We have economic challenges in this country. But spending more government resources is not the answer. We have about a $15 trillion economy. Even with a $3.5 trillion federal budget, the federal player is small, small. Eight and a half cents of every dollar in education in Georgia comes to the federal government. The rest comes from exactly where you would expect it to come from, local communities and state governments. We have to get the government out of the way. And if you're worried about uncertainty, as I am, if you share our concern about uncertainty, then let's pass H.R. 1. Let's be done. Let's be done with this two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. Let's get us through the end of the year. Let's finish the job that we should have gotten done last year. Let's put it behind us, and let's start that new open process again. And it's one that I look forward to, to joining my colleagues in. With that, I reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Colorado. Yeah. Thank you. I yield myself 30 seconds uh, briefly to respond. Uh, H.R. 1 cannot be looked at as a serious budget, budget document. Now, it's not about the cuts, 61 billion, 70 billion. What, we can come to a number that we can agree. And by the way, you can't come to a serious number without making sure that defense is also on the table. But what we have with H.R. 1 is a bill that loads up every piece of the far-right social agenda in one bill, from restricting a woman's right to choose to preventing government from protecting the air we breathe and the water we drink. So if we want to have a discussion about a serious budget document and serious cuts, that's one thing. If we want to have a far-right dream list, that's expired. another. I yield four minutes to the gentleman from Washington, the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Dix. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Before. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, the CR disproportionately cuts uh, education, especially literacy efforts. David Brooks, not a known as uh, a, a left-wing journalist, writes in the New York Times column today, if you look across the country, you see education financing getting sliced, often in the most thoughtless and destructive ways. In Washington, the Republicans who designed the cuts for this fiscal year 
seem to have done no serious policy evaluation. Last night, I asked the Rules Committee to make an order an amendment restoring education cuts. The amendment cut $1 billion from the census in money that wasn't needed, applying most of that to offset education spending, and the remainder went to further reducing the deficit below the levels in the CR before us. The Rules Committee chose not to make that amendment in order, and therefore I oppose the rule. But to talk to the gentleman, uh, I, have, this is, uh, I spent eight years on the staff of the other body, and this is my 35th year in the House of Representatives, okay? Nobody ever gets everything they want. There is a process where we have the House passes a bill, goes to the Senate, and then we have a conference committee, or the Senate sends the bill back to us. And, and both sides meet and work out their differences. There's give and take. There's compromise. And that is the way this process works. And I, I also want to say to the gentleman uh, and to your side, remember, it was the Democratic Congress and the Senate, House Senate and, the, and Mr. Obama signing the $41 billion cut from the Obama FY11 budget. It was the Democrats that did it. We had one Republican vote, Walter Jones. And I just want to remind you, that was done in December with the, in a lame duck session, which turned out to be a very effective lame duck session. And in that, in that uh, bill, we made cuts across the board in all these areas. So, you know, we, I want to make it clear, we are also for deficit reduction. But what I am worried about, and I know the gentleman is very sincere, I can tell that, I know you believe in every word that you're saying, but the biggest problem with this is that what the effect will be on our economy. Moody says, Mark Zandi says, it will cost us 400,000 jobs in 11, 700,000 jobs in 12. Goldman Sachs, who I don't normally quote, they say that this could cut one and a half to two percent out of uh, gross domestic product. That could mean the loss of 2.4 million jobs over the next two years. That's not what you want to do. You're trying to reduce the deficit. And the way you reduce the deficit is put people back to work. You get them back to work and they pay their taxes in and the deficit comes down. The unemployment rate comes down. If you do the wrong thing, and make dr draconian cuts at the same time that the states are cutting $125 billion from their budgets, the impact of those two things, $61 billion and, and the 125, could have a very devastating effect on the economy and hurt a lot of programs needlessly because it's going to be counterproductive. I just hope that you think about that. Is, is there any theory, economic theory that I've ever heard of, called cut and grow. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, you know, even supply-side economics uh, would m maybe be embraced there. Seconds. Uh, uh, so again, 30 seconds. again, it was the Democratic Congress that cut the $41 billion. It, and every reputable economist says what you did in H.R. 1 is going to have a negative effect on the economy. And so I hope you all think carefully about what you're about to do. And again, it takes compromise. And you've got to work with the other body to come up with a reasonable solution here, or we're going to have problems with the government shutdown. And it's, you know, uh, you can say whatever you want. We don't need the government shutting down when we're in two wars, a war in Afghanistan and a war in Iraq and a global war on terror. We don't need to shut the government down. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds uh, only to say that's why we're here today. Uh, as the gentleman knows, so that there is no government shutdown. And I, I could not be more proud uh, that we're here taking that responsibility exactly as seriously uh, as it is. And it's very difficult to have a conversation about jobs when we have carbon regs coming down the pipe that will destroy jobs. We have financial regulations coming down the pipe that will destroy jobs. We have health care regs coming down the pipe that will destroy jobs over and over again. My folks are saying enough. And with that, I yield such time as he may consume with, to the gentleman from California, the Chairman of the 
Rules Committee, the gentleman that I give uh, credit to uh, uh, giving us the most open process on a continuing resolution uh, that we've seen in modern times. Gentlemen, process. I appreciate what you all did in having an open rule. I pr uh, applaud uh, uh, Chairman Rogers and Chairman Dreyer. That is the right thing to do. It was appreciated on both sides of the aisle. Uh, without your support. And well, I did my best to help. The gentleman from California is recognized. Speaker, I have to and my remarks. Uh, For how much time does the gentleman wish to speak? Set as time as he may consume. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me, let me uh, just say I, I was going to begin by uh, saying that uh, both my colleagues, uh, Mr. Rogers and, uh, and Mr. Dix, did an absolutely phenomenal job at taking on the responsibility that is thrust on them uh, when we have an open amendment process. Uh, the people who go through the greatest challenge are those who have to defend the bill and be here for hours and hours and hours. And as we all know, we had 162 amendments considered on the House floor during those days that led up to uh, before adjournment, week before last. And um, we worked into the morning on every occasion. That means after midnight. I mean, I guess we adjourned at 2 or 3 on some of those days. I was sound asleep then, I have to admit. But you guys were working very, very hard, Mr. Speaker, and I, I want to thank them. And I was pleased that those in the minority uh, did recognize that doing what we did was unprecedented. Never before has a continuing resolution been considered under the process that we've had. At best, it's been a structured rule, which is what we had two decades ago, and both political parties had had usually a closed rule for the consideration of continuing resolutions uh, up to that point. And so I do believe that we have come together with, as, uh, as Mr. Woodall has said, a package that included amendments from both sides of the aisle as we proceed with this. Now, I, I was tickled also to hear uh, my friend talk about the fact that uh, $41 billion in cuts were made uh, under Democratic leadership. The fact that both sides of the aisle are now talking about and bragging about ways to cut spending is, I think, a very encouraging sign because that is the message. That's the message that Mr. Woodall was just offering. The, constant expansion of government is in fact um, counterproductive in our quest to create jobs and get the economy moving. Now we had this exchange last uh, night in the Rules Committee, yesterday afternoon in the Rules Committee, Mr. Speaker, in which we were talking about Mark Zandi and the Goldman Sachs projections as far as bringing about spending reductions. And I brought to the fore um, one of the most brilliant economists I know, John Taylor, who is at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, former uh, Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, a very good personal friend of mine. His son used to, to work in our office. He's a proud, uh, served in the United States Marine Corps. And I, I've got to say, Mr. Speaker, that John Taylor, in responding to the Zandi quote, made it very clear that the notion, the notion of not bringing about spending reductions would, in fact, exacerbate the economic challenges that we have and the bottom line is the best way for us to get our economy growing is to ensure that people can keep more of their hard-earned money and to restrict the kind of control that the federal government has continued to thrust on um, on individuals and I'd be happy to yield to my friend if he'd like to share one of those quotes well me. let me just he's, he's let me just make a brief comment and and I do applaud the gentleman uh, from California uh, as chairman of the rules committee for giving to working out that open modified open rule, uh, uh, just let me on, on the on the point about Mr. Taylor at Stanford. And Stanford's a very good school. My son graduated from it. And I'm quite proud of that. A letter signed by 300 of America's leading economists makes the argument that cutting investments this quickly will undermine growth. Among the original signers from Stanford alone, Kenneth Arrow, Martin Carnoy, Paul David. Uh, Mordecai's Kurz, Roger Knoll, and Gavin Wright. Mr. Speaker, if I, if I could reclaim my time, I would say to my friend, I think what we've just shown is that um, the, the proverbial, you know, economists say on one hand, on the other hand, the fact is uh, not every economist agrees on this notion, but there, uh, a statement has been made, and in fact my friend made it upstairs, and that is he said when he was quoting Mark Zandi that everyone 
basically every economist, and that was what I inferred from the statement, came to this conclusion. And my point in, in, in actually referencing Professor Taylor is that there is disagreement on it. I happen to come down on the side, personally, of Mr. Taylor. I think it's important for us, just because we want to all encourage individual initiative and responsibility, to do everything that we can to reduce the size and scope and reach of government. And that's what the goal of HR1 is, so that we can get the economy growing. And I, I believe that more incentives by reducing that tax and regulatory burden will create jobs because we do share that goal. I mean, I'm convinced that everyone wants to do that, but this notion that, uh, I mean, I've heard the commentators saying that somehow that, that, that Republicans in saying that we might see a reduction in the number of federal government jobs that were not for job creation. We want people to have good long-term jobs in the private sector, and that's our goal here. This rule is a standard rule. I should say at the outset that we wanted to have this, not a closed rule, but a modified closed rule. And I know my friend was concerned that his amendment that he uh, testified in behalf of in the Rules Committee wasn't made in order. But I will tell you that we did, from the very beginning, say to uh, the minority leader, Ms. Pelosi, that when she, having introduced on February 18th her substitute proposal, that basically kept spending at the 2010 levels, that we would have made that in order and it would have made it a modified uh, closed rule uh, that we had offered. So we did do that. We are where we are. Keeping, uh, ensuring that we don't go through a government shutdown is something that Chairman Rogers and I know Mr. Dix and all of us in leadership positions, uh, rank and file members alike, want to avoid. And that's why we've got this two year, uh, this two week package that's before us. I hope the Senate will act so that we can. Uh, do that, and then do what we all want to make sure happens, and that is have a negotiated agreement that will get to where, where we need to be. And so I thank my friend for his uh, management of this rule, just as he managed the, uh, the last open rule. And well, before Jeff, I yield back, I guess I should yield I to just wanna, I just want to say one brief word. I applaud these modified open rules, and on the regular bills on appropriations, we hope, Mr. Rogers and I have been in contact, and we're going to try to get these bills done in a timely way. Right. And, and we want open rules, and we want to be able to have these unanimous consent agreements after the right. bills have been on the floor for a while in order to narrow the amendments yep. and then to get these things done in a timely fashion. And I think it's going to take the cooperation of all the members to be able to do that. If I could reclaim my time, I will say the gentleman is absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we want to have something that we haven't had uh, in the last couple of years, and that is an open amendment process when it comes to the regular appropriations bills and Mr. Rogers and I have been discussing that at length and will continue to and I believe that the best way to deal with this is for the not leadership but for the floor managers to come together and uh, work out an agreement on that and so with that I yield back the balance That's of my exactly time. what happened this time on I think the most difficult appropriation bill that's ever been considered. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Yield myself 30 seconds uh, to respond. I join the gentleman from Washington in uh, praising the gentleman from California, the chair of the Rules Committee, with regard to the modified open process that this body was able to undertake. Uh, but again, with regard to this particular bill before us, uh, what the gentleman from California said is that the Democrats would be allowed to offer an amendment that would spend more, but not allowed to offer a substitute amendment that would spend less. The Democrats, in fact, don't have a desire to offer forward a substitute amendment that spends more. We do have a desire to offer a substitute amendment that Mr. Dix came forward uh, that does less. The rule doesn't allow for that. With that, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman's recognized. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the House, let's take the next two weeks and try to work together to do the right thing for the American people. I believe that the right thing for the American people is to come up with a budget plan that sensibly reduces spending, but does not put American jobs at risk. What do I mean by this? What do we mean by this? Let me give you an example. I think that a policy that says that oil companies, which made $77 billion in profit last year alone, can drill on federally owned property that's offshore and not pay anything in royalties to the American taxpayer is wasteful and we should stop it. I think provisions that say that there are tax loopholes for companies that outsource jobs out of our country are wasteful and we should stop them. Let's get rid of those things from our budget. 
But let's not follow the reckless plan of the majority that says in education, let's cut funding for 10,000 reading tutors and math coaches. In education, let's cut funding for 7,000 teachers of autistic children, children with a learning disability. In border security, let's cut funding that's used to pay the people who board ships and inspect containers that come into this country to make sure they don't have dirty bombs in them. In public safety, let's not cut funding that will lay off police officers and firefighters in towns around our country. In health care, let's not count, cancel hundreds, if not thousands, of research grants where our best researchers are working on cures for cancer or dementia or diabetes. These are reckless cuts. The problem with the Republican plan is not just that it disrupts the United States government. The problem with the American plan, it disrupts the United States economy. And this is why the leading economist for John McCain's presidential campaign of two years ago says this plan the Republicans are offering will cost 700,000 jobs. That's why the, the largest investment bank in the country, in a non-political way, says that this Republican plan will cut in half the economic growth the country is counting on for this year. Let's not disrupt jobs in this country. Let's cut wasteful spending. Let's go after corporate welfare, not special education. Let's go after oil company giveaways, not Head Start. Let's get back to the business of debating job creation in the private sector in our country, not defunding Planned Parenthood. Is recognized for 30 seconds. There are 15 million unemployed Americans as we meet here this afternoon. Let us resolve in the next two weeks to put their interests first, to sensibly reduce spending where we can, to invest in education and health care where we must, and get on with the people's business. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 10 seconds just to invite my friend from New Jersey to join me on H.R. 25, the fair tax. Uh, not only will it create jobs in this country, it's the only bill in Congress that will eliminate every single corporate piece of welfare, loophole, tax exception, credit, so on and so on, uh, because none of them need a nickel of it. Gentleman's time and I, I, uh, I reserve the balance of my time. Uh, Gentleman has reserved his time. I, I know that my good friend from Colorado has the Gentleman time. Gentleman from Colorado. Well, you yield 20 seconds for response. I would, I would ask the gentleman what the sales tax rate would be on his fair tax proposal to American families for buying something. Given that it eliminates the payroll tax, which is the largest tax that 80% of American families pay. What is the sales pay, tax rate? 23%. 23% in every Less purchase. Less than what I, they're paying I, uh, I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Richardson. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for two minutes. I request to address the House and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong opposition to the rule of this continuing resolution that the Republicans have brought forward. Why? Number one, it's for 14 days. Can you imagine one of the most powerful economies in this country, and we're talking about doing kind of in a pause mode for 14 days? That's not very responsible. But let's get to the specifics. Why I'm opposed to this, this CR would slash $340 million for construction jobs, for projects of the Army Corps. Now, I just heard the previous speaker talk about private jobs. Are we prepared to say that this government, we don't think there should be any federal government jobs? So are you to tell me for in my district where I have two ports, the largest ports in the nation, that we don't need to do dredging, that we can just have ships run afoul? You know, I mean, how are we going to continue our economy? I support cuts. If you check my record, you'll see that I've supported many of the initiatives that have been brought forward. But they need to be thoughtful, and they need to make sense. A few others that concern me greatly. A slash of $20 million to the Department of Homeland Security. What are we thinking here? Haven't we learned anything from Hurricane Katrina or 9-11? That we would suggest to cut $103 million of FEMA state and local programs that would provide grants to avoid disasters and how we prepare for them. $129 million from higher education. I would ask, what is this 14 days about? 
We've talked about that we're prepared. Everyone's going to come here and make these cuts. Well, let's have a real civil discussion and let's build upon last week, but let's not do it on the backs of the American people. There is waste that can be addressed, and I look forward to supporting those initiatives. But this 14-day pause button is the wrong way, and I'm opposed to it. I yield back the balance of my time. General lady yields back. Gentleman from Georgia. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to this rule and to this bill. This CR is further proof that the majority does not care about the unemployment crisis. This really is a question of our morality as a nation. Are we going to eat a loaf of bread that is spotted with the mold of conservatism and so-called fiscal uh, responsibility? Or are we going to bring to our children a loaf of bread that is healthy, whole wheat, and good for America? This bill represents a loaf of bread, and I, I might point out that the speaker uh, yesterday or a few days ago said something about, well, if they don't want to eat the whole loaf of bread at one time, then I'm going to make them eat it uh, one slice at a time. Well, every slice is, is speckled with mold of this old-fashioned, old way of thinking that got us into this problem that we're in now. What we have done is given the keys to the car that they drove into the ditch back to them, and now we are forced to eat bread in that car, molded bread in that car, that is going nowhere but down. Mark Zandi said 700,000 jobs will be lost if we do it the way that these uh, Republicans who cannot drive if we allow them to do that, not simply looking ahead for my children and for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, I cannot in good faith go along with this. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Georgia. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. I'd like Gentleman to inquire Colorado. if the other side has any remaining speakers. Uh, I'm the final speaker. I'll, I'll close whenever you're ready. Very good. I yield myself uh, as much time as uh, uh, remains. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Mr. Speaker, we all share the goal of reducing the deficit. But if we're serious about deficit reduction, we need to look at defense as one of the line items. I'm a member of the Spending Cuts and Deficit Reduction Working Group, and I've worked with my colleagues to identify more than $70 billion in savings that can be used for deficit reduction. If Republicans truly claim to be committed to deficit reduction, then why? As they cut millions from programs like Even Start and Leap, do they spare defense spending? The short-term CR carries forward the 2010 defense budget, but the policies, priorities, and levels proposed for 2010 no longer apply. Our current military expenditures support bloated troop levels and bases across Europe that, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Speaker, are relics of a bygone era. Rather than fighting the demons of the past, we need to focus on the very real threats of the present and future. Who are we fighting? The Nazis? The Soviets? The French? It's time for us to rethink our defense spending. It's clear that the current strategy is one that we cannot afford. The expenditures in Afghanistan are $100 billion. It's been estimated that there's only at most 100 Al-Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan. That's a spending level of $1 billion per Al-Qaeda operative in Afghanistan. Most of Al-Qaeda's operations have moved across the border to Pakistan and they've also gained a foothold in Yemen. Meanwhile, we're bogged down in a costly war with no clear endgame. Let's get serious about balancing the budget. Let's find savings in every agency, including Department of Defense. Until we get serious about controlling defense spending, the largest component of the discretionary budget, we will never achieve our goals of reducing the deficit. This CR claims to only cut earmarks, but in reality we're playing a shell game. 
This continuing resolution states that earmarks have no legal effect, which means that agencies have not been funding these programs. It means that the Department of Homeland Security, for example, will have $264 million less to prepare and respond to threats and disasters and protect our ports. Two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, members from both sides of the aisle proposed amendments to enact even more cuts. My friend from New York, Mr. Nadler, proposed cutting funding to Afghanistan so that we could have a responsible withdrawal, saving $90 billion. My friend from Arizona, Mr. Flake, proposed a very reasonable cut to the Department of Defense's operation and maintenance budget so that we could get rid of funding for unneeded boards and commissions. I've also heard from many of my Republican friends that we want to go back to 2008 levels. Well, my colleague from California, Mr. Stark and Ms. Lee, proposed to do just that with the defense budget. Let's get real on deficit reduction and lead the way with real cuts that actually balance the budget. The President is proposing real change for public education through funds investing in the Innovation and Early Learning Challenge Fund, and we see none of these solutions in the proposed CR. As we look to agree on the budget for the rest of the fiscal year, it's critical that we have many meaningful resources for our public schools, particularly at a time when they are under increasing budget pressure from districts and state cutbacks. Education of our children in our youngest years is a research-proven return on investment. We have no second or third chance with kids. They're only young once. By ending literacy support for our children, and restricting proven school improvements in repeated short-term CRs, we run the risk of opening the door to a spending agenda that eliminates jobs. Mr. Speaker, it's critical that we give the markets and businesses the predictability that they need with regard to the ongoing operations of government. A two-week continuing resolution simply fails to do that. We will be back before this body again to do it again, regardless of the outcome today. But I hope, Mr. Speaker, that we can work across the aisle to put together a real long-term solution to keep the federal government open. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, could I inquire how much time I have remaining? Three and three-quarter minutes. Oh. Mr. Speaker, we're here today for one reason and one reason only, and that's to provide ample time for the Senate to consider H.R. 1 to keep the doors of the federal government open, to keep important services being dispensed, to keep the government of America on track for two more weeks while the Senate takes time. I, I'll associate myself with the gentleman from, from Washington when he says we can't always get what we want. I, I sadly haven't gotten what I wanted uh, uh, so far, and I'm prepared to get even less of what I want going forward. But I don't mind telling you, I don't know how we're going to get to what any of us want if folks don't even start considering the bill that this was our very best shot. It was our very best work product, whether you love it or whether you hate it. It was the most openly produced work product in continuing resolutions history. And there it sits. And there it sits. Almost 10 days now with no, with, with no uh, advancement uh, whatsoever. Mr. Speaker, I hope these two weeks are enough. I recognize the caution that uh, my friend from Colorado suggests that we may be back here uh, one more time uh, doing this again. I hope this is the last, uh, the last time that we'll be here. But I know this. I know we can't continue to mortgage our children's future while we wait. I know we can't fiddle while, while Rome burns. And so we have passed, we have presented this uh, continuing resolution with cuts there to prevent our children's future from continuing to be mortgaged. As I, as I spoke with school groups across the district, uh, last week, and I share my friend from Colorado's passion for, for education. I asked them to turn on C-SPAN this week because I said it doesn't matter who stands up, whether they stand up on the left or on the right, whether they speak from the well or from the leadership table, they will tell you that the reason they are there today is for you. It's for you, the children. It's for your future that they are there on the floor of that house. I believe that. I believe in everyone's heart they're here to make sure that tomorrow's generation does better uh, than today's generation. And I would just say, Mr. Speaker, that if there are school children out there watching today, perhaps they'll pick up the phone and they'll give us a call, let us know exactly which one of us are on the right track, because I know it's all about them that we do what we do. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time, and I move the previous question. Gentleman yields back. The uh, question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Speaker, I ask for the yeas and nays.
The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number of uh, having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the question of adoption of a resolution. The U.S. House a week and a half ago passed a continuing passed a budget bill, H.R. 1. $60 billion in cuts from the President's proposed fiscal year 2011 budget, a bill that would carry the spending through the end of this fiscal year. The current spending bill um, ends up, is uh, done as of this Friday, March the 4th, and so that's why the House is back today debating this uh, continuing resolution, a bill that would uh, cut $4 billion from current spending through Friday, March 18th, and that's so the, the Senate can debate the bill, and the uh, Senate and House negotiators and the President can come to an agreement on spending for the rest of fiscal year 2011. Vicki Needham of the Hill is covering the debate on Capitol Hill. This $4 billion that's proposed to be cut from this continuing resolution, where, is that, where are those cuts happening? It's, it's um, from some uh, earmark spending and also from President Obama's fiscal 2012 budget request. Um, and he has put in some uh, terminations of programs. So House Republicans went back and looked at those earmarks and looked at those, um, those terminations and, and put about $4 billion worth of them together. Is there a sense that two weeks through Friday the March the 18th is enough time that the Senate can finish its work, that the, uh, the two bodies can agree to a spending bill that would carry through the end of this fiscal year? Well, the, the two-week um, uh, bill, even though the House uh, looks on course to pass it, um, the Senate is definitely still talking a little bit more about a 30-day bill. Um, so the appropriations chairman, um, Daniel Inouye, did say today that he feels like the Senate does need some more time to look at these numbers. And they have been asking for that 30-day. That started last week with a bill from Senator Harry Reid. Um, so we're still looking at that in between. And, and it could be that if they get two weeks, they might have to go back again and try to either get that longer bill or possibly do another 30-day or another two weeks. You just have to see how that pans out. When is the Senate expected, the earliest the Senate is expected to act on this continued resolution? The Senate could pick up um, a bill as early as tomorrow. They could, depending upon what they produce, if they do still want a 30-day bill, uh, they do have a bill uh, ready to go over in the Senate. And they could start so, so as early as tomorrow, and obviously tomorrow's Wednesday, and uh, the, uh, this current funding does indeed expire at the end of Friday. In some of the early debate in the uh, U.S. House so far, there's been a lot of talk about forecasts by, by Moody's Mark Zandi and also by Goldman Sachs on potential job losses. Uh, what are they talking about here? Well, both of those groups had said that um, Zandi's report yesterday came out and said that, that the it's if they, there are $60 billion in cuts from this current um, uh, continuing resolution, that would cost about 700,000 jobs. It could cost um, a few tenths of a percentage point of GDP over the next couple quarters into next year. Um, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke kind of stepped back from that today. He said their analysis showed that it would maybe be one or two tenths of a, of a point and that he wasn't sure specifically on the job losses, but did say he did not think that they would be as high as 700,000. He said he would expect losses and slower growth, but he didn't really expect that it would be um, too, 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 too bad or, or harm that recovery. So that does give a little bit of a, a boost to the Republican argument on these spending cuts. Vicki Needham covering the House debate on the budget. You can read her articles online at thehill.com. Thank you for that update. Thank you very much. As we get back to the first vote here on the House floor, 15-minute vote, a previous question, procedural vote ahead of uh, the vote on the rule, and the rule will allow for an hour of uh, general debate, final vote this afternoon. We're opening up our phone lines for your thoughts on this particular bill. It proposes $4 billion in cuts, so do you think that's enough, or is it too much? Here are the numbers for Democrats, 202-585-3885. Republicans, it's 202-585-3886. Independence and others, 
3887. Make sure you mute your television, and if you've called in and gotten on the air here at C-SPAN, let others call in this afternoon. We go first to uh, Fairfield, California. Kirk on our Democrats line. Oh, thanks for the time. I, I'm really enjoying the, the C-SPAN. Thanks for being there. Um, you know, I'm a Democrat, and, you know, I, I'm of the, the mind that we do have to make cuts. You know, it's clear. Um, I've got a beautiful 13-year-old, a uh, straight-A student. Uh, the teachers have been wonderful. Um, uh, the teachers don't complain. Uh, as parents, we help out at our school. Um, um, but I'm hearing between the Democrats and Republicans today that there's uh, congratulations of openness and inclusiveness. And this is the beginning of greatness. If our two sides can come together and truly know that we all don't get what we want, but we do the best for our children, um, I think we have a chance at this. Um, but we do get to stem this tide. Uh, Four billion is exactly the right amount, and it's going to hurt, and their family's going to suffer as a result of that. But it's necessary, and uh, I just pray for wisdom for this uh, country. But thanks for being there, and thanks for the time. Richard is a Republican in Niagara Falls. Your thoughts on the proposed budget cuts? Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you too. How are you today? Doing doing just fine. That's good. You know that that illustration that was brought up. Uh, not long ago from that one senator there from what uh, I had seen here on C-SPAN thank you for C-SPAN uh, for being here uh, my goodness that that's pretty raw and rotten to do to carry on and to add to an illustration the president came up with about driving a car and storing moldy bread I don't think so I don't think so. that that was a poor, rotten illustration brought up in the first place. It, you know, we need to go back to our history, find out, see where the thought processes were of the original uh, standing is, I believe, too. We need to get back to our Constitution. Richard was referring to some of the comments of uh, Hank Johnson on the floor just a short while ago. And by the way, you can always watch a debate online in our Congressional Chronicle at uh, cspan.org. Next up is uh, Kenna in Mississippi on our independent line. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to thank CSPAN for being there, first of all. Um, I think that um, we all could work together as far as cuts are concerned. Um, we all share a part in, in this, everything that's going on around us. Um, the, our main concern is education here in Mississippi, and um, I think maybe if more of the Democrats and the Republicans, independents, everyone, if we all work together and if, if these people would quit taking their own personal interests and, and throwing them, you know, throwing, you know, the personal interests, way of what really needs to take place. You know, we, we, we need to um, have common ground on things that we all agree on, and we need to work with the president so that we all, you know, could, could you know, we, we all could do this. I mean, you know, some I think some of what's going on is people's taking, um, they're wanting to, I guess, um, use their, their, um, their power to um, pretty much, you know, uh, make decisions or whatever. But if they're going to make decisions for the people, then they need to make the decisions that we want them to make because these are our tax dollars and um, they shouldn't be so, um, I guess, one-sided or, you know, one-tracked or whatever. We need to, we need more openness and we need more honesty. Thank you. Kenna, in Mississippi, she mentioned education, and there are several education programs. There are eight proposed programs to be cut in, in this $4 billion in cuts, eight programs for which the administration sought no funds nor proposed terminating, and among those includes the Education Department's Striving Readers Program, eliminating an estimated $250 million. There are also earmarks proposed uh, to be cut. Let's go next to uh, Olathe, Kansas, and Josh is on our Democrats line. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I was just, I, I'm a Democrat. I'm actually a recent college graduate. And I've followed politics throughout high school and everything. But what I'm sick and tired of hearing from the Republican side, and this goes statewide and federal, 
is the supposed air of openness and wanting to get the fiscal house in order. Instead, they're wanting to just make this nation into separate but equal, supposedly. And they're wanting to separate between the welfare lines and who has all the power. We need to actually get our fiscal house in order by looking at things that are faulty and not educational based because our education is where we lack right now and we need to get that in order as well. Thank you. Montreal, Missouri, Republican or Republican on the line. This is uh, Linda. Hey there. Hello. You're on the air. Go ahead. Okay, I've come up with an idea. They're asking everybody in the United States to cut, to watch your groceries, to watch the gas is going up, you name it, it's doing it. Now, why do we have to pay the Congress and the Senate their bills, their credit cards, their salaries? Why do they not cut theirs in half, and why do they not strive like the people that is doing in the United States and trying to meet everything on less money that they have right now. I think if you take half their money and you take their credit cards and you let them go and buy the groceries and don't have their little maids and their little chauffeurs, you know what? Then they see what the people is up against and they wonder why everybody is so mad and does not want to have anything to do with the Congress or the House or anybody that is in Washington. Once again, the budget is back on the House floor today, debating the continuing resolution, your short-term spending bill through uh, March the 18th. That's because current spending ends this Friday the 4th. This is the first uh, vote in a couple that will come up today, the procedural vote, and on the rule, when the rule will be voted on next, it will allow for an hour of general debate on the continuing resolution, which again cuts $4 billion from current spending and that includes uh, some earmarks as well. So we're going to continue taking your calls for the next couple of minutes. Earlier caller, uh, actually Vicki Needham from the Hill, had mentioned comments by Ben Bernanke. He testified on Capitol Hill earlier today, a hearing that we covered and be able to see uh, later online. The Hill writes, Vicki Needham, as a matter of fact, covering that, she wrote that uh, Ben Bernanke says the plan from Republicans to cut $61 billion in spending this year would not harm economic growth. She writes the GOP's proposed spending cuts, part of that passed as that, uh, that bill two weeks ago, would reduce, quote, growth on the margins and lower gross domestic product by only one or two tenths of a percent. This is Ben Bernanke before the Senate Banking Committee earlier. And again, that's uh, on our website at cspan.org. Back to calls, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, excuse me, Wisconsin, and uh, Pam's on our Democrats line. Yeah, hi. Um, I just have a comment on uh, the budget, and I think if it was truly a shared sacrifice, uh, everyone would go along with it. But we know it's not. Uh, with the, the tax cuts for the rich, I think is is very unfair than to ask the poor and the middle class to give up. I think they really need to rethink a lot of this. Uh, the Tea Party, I think they're all going to be shaking their heads when they start losing programs that they want and are going to get cut. Um, just like the problems we have in Madison, Wisconsin right now, trying to destroy the Democratic Party by giving up our rights to bargain. But, um, are, that's about all I have to say. Are those Democratic senators any closer to coming back to the state there, Pam? I sure hope not. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks for your call. Louisiana, Danette's on, on our Republican line from Louisiana. Hi there. What are your thoughts on this, um, this House budget debate? I think it ought to be the $61 billion. They can't get much more than what I'm giving now. I think they ought to cut this. And Paul was on the TV earlier about, oh, it's a shame we're going to have to cut Head Start. Well, half those kids can't even get on a bus. They're too short, and the driver will not help them on. Asked in Oklahoma, uh, Ronnie's on our Democrats line. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'd like to thank C-SPAN for being on the air, and I, I wish that every American person would watch it. And I want to agree with that Republican lady that while we're all giving up everything, why isn't Democrat or the uh, House and the Senate and the President and all them giving up some of their money? And why are the oil companies, they're sitting there making all these profits. Here we are now. We're having to pay more for gasoline again. 
And that's about all I have to say. I just wish everybody would get together and, and we'd get this country back on the straight and narrow. Thank you. To our independent line in Columbus, Ohio, Diane, hello there. Hi there. Um, I, I agree with many of the previous callers. Uh, one of the things that just really irks me is when I hear typically it's the Republicans say that, you know, they're concerned about the future for their children and don't want to balance the budget on the back of their children. And I think, oh, my gosh, you are cutting all these programs that affect children. That's what we need to be looking at, not 20 years down the line. 20 years down the line, when you've cut these programs, we're going to have bigger problems than you have right now. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank John, you. Thank you. Um, John Boehner of Ohio, the speaker, CQ reports that today he rebuffed a suggestion from the White House and some Senate Democrats that Congress pass a four-week stopgap spending bill instead of the two-week measure that House Republicans are supporting. A couple more calls here as the vote continues in uh, Washington. North Carolina, Walter, on a Republican line. Uh, yes, uh, neither one of those are enough cuts in the budget, but I have two simple solutions that will solve our problem. The first is take oil off the stock market and stop letting speculators bid it up. The second is take the Americans out of the unemployment lines and put them back to work. Push the illegal aliens out of the mainstream workforce and put Americans back to work. That would solve most of our problems. One more call here, Youngstown, Ohio, Joseph, on yeah, our Democrats line. The best thing I would think is to give this stuff all back to the Republicans. Let them do what they want to do. You know what they'll do? They'll run this country right down the drain again, as they've done before. Because all they think about is big business, oil companies, and getting their money so they can get reelected again. That's all they care about. They don't care about the young, the smart young people in this country, or, or any of the of the middle class. They want to run the middle class out of out of work, out of everything. Well, there's more debate ahead on the budget. This is a procedural vote, the previous question vote, and the rule will allow for an hour of general debate. So they'll lack, likely wrap up work on this uh, temporary spending measure, this two-week CR today, and then it'll be the Senate Senate term, uh, Senate's turn rather. And Vicki Needham mentioned in her report that. The Senate possibly taking it that up uh, that up tomorrow. In the meantime, the Senate is working today on one of the biggest changes to U.S. patent and trademark law in decades. The Senate will be coming back in in under a half an hour, 2:15 Eastern, and you can follow that on our companion network, C-SPAN 2.
on this vote. The yeas are 2-3-0, 230. On this vote, the yeas are 241, the nays are 179. The previous question is ordered. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. On that, I I, Mr. Speaker, on that, I request the yeas and the nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. And they're voting on the rule for this temporary spending bill. The rule would allow for an hour of general debate, no amendments, and one motion to recommit. This temporary spending bill, this CR, would cut $4 billion. It would provide funding for government programs for the next two weeks through Friday, March the 18th, this allowing the uh, Senate to take up the measure and negotiations off the floor to continue. Writing about that, the Associated Press says that negotiations over a longer-term solution are likely to be very difficult as Speaker Boehner seeks to satisfy his 87-member freshman class, many of whom were elected with Tea Party support, but still managed to reach a deal with Democrats controlling the Senate and the White House. That's from the Associated Press. So this is a five-minute vote on the rule if it, if it passes an hour of general debate ahead.
The House is voting on the rule for the continuing resolution funding the government for the next two weeks through Friday, March the 18th, cutting $4 billion in spending. Ahead, an hour of general debate with uh, no amendments allowed, but a motion to recommit. A view on that continuing resolution, two different views, two different tweets from both sides of the aisle. Norm Dix, appropriations ranking member, tweets that setting up a showdown crisis every two weeks is not a responsible way to govern. And new representative Tim Scott says, I'm ready for more, ready to cut spending and good debates. A couple of comments at uh, twitter.com slash c-span where you'll find the tweets from uh, members of Congress. On this vote, the yeas are 251, the nays are 170. Once again, on this vote, the yeas are 251, the nays are 170. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Purpose is a